Greetings and welcome to Mr. Van Lowe's poorly monetized low budget science channel. Do not click like, do not subscribe. Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about topic 5.1, uh, and this is the first of two lessons. Okay, this one is in regard to electric charge and Coulomb's law. So, first, let's go over your learning objectives. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify two forms of charge and the direction of forces between them. You will be able to explain the quantization of electric charge, describe the relationship between Coulombic force, distance, and charge, and state the relationship between Coulomb's constant and permittivity of vacuum. Uh, finally, you'll be able to solve problems involving, Coulomb, uh, involving Coulomb's law but that will be outside of the scope of this lesson. That'll be work you do on your own. Okay, so first, let's talk about electric charge. Uh, yes, it can be transferred by rubbing objects together. Okay, so an example of this would be rubbing a balloon on your head. If you've ever done this, it's pretty fun. That balloon will then stick to stuff, and that's an example of Coulombic force. Uh, electric charge can be either positive or negative, and we'll see the sources of those momentarily. Uh, electrons move from one object to another, thereby changing the net or total charge on both objects. And as I said earlier, these charged objects exert a force on each other, such as the balloon on uh, bits of your hair or against a wall which is a fun time. Don't do it on a humid day. It just won't work. Okay, so uh, in this diagram we see like charges. They could be positive or negative, doesn't really matter, but uh, a negative charge and a negative charge here will repel, okay? Uh, and we would say here that the direction of force was positive in this case. Here we have opposite charges and these are attractive. And here we would be looking at negative force. And when you get into the math, that'll become really apparent pretty quick. Okay, so uh, your force has a positive sign here. Your force has a negative sign here. Uh, the blue arrows, of course, show the force acting on these objects. So these are just balls on strings. And you, you can actually set the, this experiment up with... Uh, some styrofoam balls or maybe even some ping pong balls. You can charge them up with, uh, I don't know, rabbit's fur, silk, or whatever. There you go. So where does charge come from? Answer, protons and electrons. So yes, charge is due to the presence of those things, protons and electrons. And when a substance doesn't have a balanced charge, uh, it then has a charge due to the imbalance. So if it has more protons than electrons, it will be positively charged because protons have a positive charge. If it has more electrons than protons, it will become negatively charged. Protons and electrons have the same magnitude of charge. And that's going to bring us to a property called quantization. Uh, and this will come up a lot in modern physics, um, so let's chat. Charge only occurs as a multiple of the elementary charge, so you can think of it in terms of like a staircase going up. Um, rather than a slide or a gradient, what you have are steps. Okay, Each step then will be a multiple of the elementary charge. Okay, so. Every time you add another electron, you go up by this factor, this value. Okay, so you would increase by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Oh, I should have animated this. Mm, oh well. So the charge of an object is determined by multiplying the number of excess protons or electrons by this number. Okay, so if you're multiplying by electrons, then your resultant net charge will be negative. So what we're looking at here with the elementary charge is the magnitude of um, charge for either a proton or uh, electron. So 
uh, if you're dealing with a proton, this is a positive sign in front of the 1.60. If you're dealing with an electron, it would become a negative sign in front of the 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay, so our unit of charge is the coulomb. And as you can see here, this uh, C is representing the coulomb. Okay, our charge only occurs as a multiple of that fundamental charge, which means that it is quantized. Okay, we get that staircase of charge rather than a, a slide. Okay, so according to Wikipedia, a quantum is the minimum amount of any physical entity or property involved in an interaction. So our fundamental charge, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, is the quantum of charge. Again, could be positive or negative. Uh, we're gonna look at topic uh, seven and 12 a little bit later, and we'll see that energy is also quantized, which uh, is really cool. And actually, um, the way electrons move is also quantized. So they're, they're orbits around uh, nuclei of atoms. Cool stuff, cool stuff. Okay, so how does charge move around? I think this is uh, helpful. So uh, we're gonna look at this in a lot of detail a little bit, a little bit later in topic five when we're talking about electricity. Uh, but for right now, we just need to establish a couple of things. First, in solids, only electrons are moving around. So the positive ions are locked into space by the uh, rigid structure of the solid and therefore they do not move freely. So when we're talking about the transfer of charge in solids, it's just electrons. In liquids, uh, things get a little more complicated because in some conditions, protons can move around. Um, and when we think about uh, protons moving around in liquids, we're usually thinking about like ionic compounds, okay? So uh, the ionic compounds could be in solution or they could be molten. And we don't really cover this too much in physics. This is more of an IB chemistry thing, so I'm just gonna leave it here. But uh, just be aware that protons can move around, but not usually in a solid state. Okay, uh, so let's talk about more moving charges. Here we can see uh, two spheres, a negatively charged sphere and a positively charged sphere and they have just been brought together. What happens is some of our electrons jump off of this negatively charged sphere onto the positively charge, charged sphere. Why? Well, it's because electrons hate each other. Uh, when you talk about attraction and repulsion, it's really fun to put it in terms of human relationships, okay? So electrons absolutely despise each other they want to get as far away from each other as they possibly, possibly can. Okay, so in the case of a sphere, and here we're kind of talking about an ideal sphere because um, in reality, if there are other electric fields or charged objects around, then it complicates the story. But so, and in theory, uh, our electrons are going to evenly distribute themselves across the surface of a sphere, okay? But when two identical objects come into charge, the electrons from these charged objects will evenly distribute across the two identical objects, okay? So the electrons are going to bounce off this onto this guy. And uh, in this case, I'm showing a positive, in a, a positive sphere and a negative sphere. They don't have to be, um, they don't have to have opposite charges. Uh, you can actually just have a charge difference between the two and this phenomenon will still occur, okay? You need a charge def differential. Um, if we assume that these objects are identical in structure and size and uh, that sort of thing, then after they've come into contact, what you're going to find is that they have exactly the same charge, okay? 
And uh, what you're also going to find in this particular diagram is you'll have a bunch of electrons on this side of this sphere hiding from the exact same number of electrons hiding over on this sphere. Um, actually, this will be a better image, okay? So you've got your electrons hiding over here and your electrons hiding over here. Remember, they're trying to get as far away from each other as possible. Okay, so <clears throat> next up, we're gonna talk about Coulomb's law for electric force. So uh, humans knew that electric force existed for a long time, but we needed a guy named Charles Augustin Coulomb to kind of set things up for us. So he discovered a couple of key things. First, force is inversely proportionate to the square of radius between charged objects or the distance between charged objects. Okay, so that gives us the first part of our equation for Coulomb's law. What we find is that force is proportionate, uh, or rather inversely proportionate to radius squared. Okay, what he also found is that force is proportional to the charge of objects ex exerting a force on each other. Okay, so what that means is, th is that the Coulombic force is proportionate to the charge of object one, and it also is also proportionate to the charge of object two. And what that effectively means is that force is proportionate to the product of these two charges, <clears throat> or proportionate individually to each one. It doesn't really matter how you think about it. Okay, now uh, we can put all this together into Coulomb's Law, which conveniently you will find in your data booklet, and it looks like this. So Coulombic force is equal to K times the charge of one of our objects times the charge of another object divided by the distance between those two objects squared, okay? So defining our variables as always, being careful to do that. Coulomb's constant is also in your data booklet under the constants section in the front of the data booklet, and you'll find that it is 8.99 times 10 to the nine Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared, okay? so if we if we wrote this as a fraction, coulombs would be in the denominator. That's what this negative 2 is telling us. Okay, so coulomb squared in the denominator of that fraction. Okay, so for our distance, r, between our charged objects, we consider the charge to be concentrated at a point at the center of the object. Okay, so... Uh, if we were talking about mass, this would be the center of mass. Since we're talking about charge, I guess we have to consider it as the center of charge. Okay, this works uh, really well for spheres, but for anything that is not spherical, and looking around, you'll notice a lot of non-spherical stuff, uh, it starts getting um, considerably more complicated very quickly. So let's just keep it to spheres. <laughs> All right, um, next, we need to talk about permittivity of free space, or um, rather, I think your book calls it permittivity of vacuum. So, guys, I don't edit my videos. That's for people who monetize their videos, which I definitely do not. Okay, back at it. Uh, so, permittivity of vacuum. Here we go. So, First thing we need to understand is that a dielectric is an insulator that can be polarized by an electric field. Okay, this isn't part of the syllabus, you don't need to know this, but if you're gonna understand what permittivity of vacuum is, it's gonna be helpful to define this stuff even though it's not going to come up on an exam, okay? Uh, these dielectrics are a big part of topic 11 where you will need to be a little more familiar with this stuff, but for topic five, you don't need to know it I'm just telling you so you understand what permittivity is. Okay, so permittivity is given by epsilon in the literature, and it's just a measure of how well a dielectric can polarize. So remember, dielectric is an insulator. It can be any insulator. Okay, 
So uh, a material with high permittivity will polarize more in response to an applied electric field than a material with low permittivity. And a vacuum is actually a pretty good insulator, not a perfect insulator, but a pretty good one. So a vacuum has a very, very, very small permittivity, and that is called the permittivity of vacuum, uh, fairly obviously. And that is given by epsilon sub zero. So when you see epsilon sub zero, you are almost inevitably going to be talking about the permittivity of vacuum. I don't think I've ever seen this used for anything else, which is uh, kind of rare in physics, actually. Um, it is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared uh, per Newton per meter squared. And if you look carefully, you might notice that this unit is the inverse of a unit we've seen already. Hold that thought, because Coulomb's constant can be expressed in terms of permittivity of vacuum, and it looks like this. So uh, Coulomb's constant K is equal to 1 divided by the quantity 4 times pi times epsilon sub 0, the permittivity of vacuum. And if you look, you will know if you look at the unit for K, you'll note that it is indeed the inverse of this unit. Nice. Um, note though that this is also a case where if you tried to apply dimensional analysis, you'd get yourself into trouble because this four pi, uh, the presence of this four pi is not obvious from the unit. So this is a case where dimensional analysis would be uh, risky. Okay, uh, we are going to check out. That is it for the lesson quick, just the way we like it. So by the end of this lesson, in theory, you should be able to identify two forms of charge and the direction of forces between them. You should also be able to explain the quantization of electrical charge. Uh, think staircase versus slide. You should be able to describe the relationship between Coulombic force, distance, and charge. We covered that in Coulomb's Law. And you should be able to state the relationship between Coulomb's constant and permittivity of vacuum. You should now attempt to solve some problems, including charge and Coulomb's law. And I have a handout for my students. If you are not my student, but just checking out this video, see if your teacher has a handout, or when all else fails, go to your textbook, start picking through some problem sets. Okay, so there you go. Uh, be aware that this is only half of topic 5.1, and this will be continued, TBC, to be continued. Okay, finally, uh, these are my sources. Do not click like, do not subscribe, and do have a great day.